when it comes to serving the Lord, you're more on a battleship than on a cruise ship. Nobody wants to man the guns. Nobody wants to put their life on the line. But Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you grab your cross and you deny yourself and let's go. Mark chapter 8. We'll be reading verses 34 through 38 as we're headed towards Easter. We're following the life of Christ as he is preparing to pay our sin debt on the cross. And we are taking a walk with him, if you will, in that process. Mark chapter 8, in verse 34 through 38. If you found that in your Bibles, why don't you stand with me, please? Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and for the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. One of the great questions in the Bible is, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And Satan is so good at getting us to take up our time with things and pleasures, and you have blessed us in the United States of America where we have so many opportunities that are certainly not wrong, but we can be so busy that we neglect the most important thing, and that's eternal life through Jesus Christ. I pray that there'd be no one neglecting that this morning. And as we as Christians stand here with a copy of your perfectly preserved word in our hands. I pray your Holy Spirit would speak to us that great things would happen this morning because we chose to be in your house. Work in us and through us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. There are companion passages, obviously, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then, of course, John. There are passages, as you know, that... Our other times relate the same occurrence. And we are going to spend more time in Luke today than we will in Mark. So if you want to go over and follow along with me, you don't need to. But I'm going to read you some passages that go along with what Jesus is speaking of as he's headed for Jerusalem. And the Gospel of Luke does a very good job in kind of highlighting all of the times that Jesus mentioned, or you could tell, that he was headed in a certain direction. I don't know if you've ever visited with someone or not, and you can tell that they're not really with you. Their mind is somewhere else. They're thinking about something else. Um, ladies, maybe you've talked to your husband at times, and you're saying, hello, hello, are you there? It's interesting that a lot of men wear hearing aids because their wife thinks they need them, but they really don't. You know, God has given men the incredible ability to not hear a female's voice. It's a gift that we have. And so a lot of times my wife will wonder if I'm paying attention to her or not. And of course, I'm glued on her every word. And uh, we'll leave it at that. So, but at the, you would have gotten the impression at times that Jesus was preoccupied, I believe, and he was. He was on his father's mission. And he was doing what he was put on earth to do. And in Luke chapter 9, verses 30 and 31, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Moses and Elijah are talking to him about his death, that he was to be accomplished in Jerusalem. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And you're familiar with the story of the transfiguration. And um, Peter, James, and John go up, with Pete, uh, go up with the Lord on top of the mountain. Moses and Elijah meet with them there. And the conversation was about the death of Christ that would happen at Jerusalem. 
chapter 9, verses 51 through 53, and it came to pass when the time was come that they should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now what's happening there is the Samaritans weren't interested in accommodating someone that didn't want to worship on Mount Gerizim. Because that's where they worshipped. And Jesus was heading for Jerusalem. And that kind of ticked them off. They don't, oh, you're going to go to Jerusalem and worship. You're too good to worship with us here. And so they were upset with him. If you follow that passage a little bit further, one of the disciples says, should we call down fire and strike them all dead? And obviously Jesus was very put off with their attitude. And he said, no, no. He said, I'm not here to, to condemn or judge but he was obviously to reach people. Now, the time will come when he will be here to condemn and judge. But he came the first time as a savior. The next time he will come as a judge. So that was what's happening in Luke chapter 9. In Luke 13, 22, and he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Luke 17, 11, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem. He passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Luke 18, 31 to 34, then he took unto them the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and make all things, and that all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He knew he was going to go and fulfill prophecy. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again and get this. And they understood none of these things. Of course not. I, I don't know that I would have either. He's talking about something that hasn't happened yet. And he's predicting how he will be uh, evilly, cruelly treated and die, but rise again. You'd think you'd, you'd, think you'd notice that. But they did not. Luke 19.11. And they heard these things, and he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God should, happen, should immediately appear. Verse 28, 19, And thus he spoke, and he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And I've got other passages here, but you can see, he is headed for Jerusalem over and over and over. Luke emphasizes the mission that he was on to head for Jerusalem, and of course that was to give his life. It is with this journey in mind that Christ speaks in Mark in our text this morning. That if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross. Jesus knew exactly what he was going for and what he was going to do, and he knew he would be taking up a cross. And he said that to those that wanted to follow him. David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa, was asked by someone if there was good roads to where he was so that other men could be sent. His answer to them was, if you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want them who will come when there is no road at all. David Livingston also said this, quote, if a commission by an earthly king is called an honor... How can a commission by a heavenly king be called a sacrifice? Isn't that interesting? If a commission by an earthly king is called an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be called a sacrifice? So, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Before we get to be required one of us, let me remind you that Jesus never asks of you what he would not do himself. He leads from the front. To follow me, number one, you need to deny yourself. And if you're in Luke chapter 9, look with me. I want to list three instances where there's some folks that wanted to follow Christ. And look in Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. If you're using a pew Bible, that's on page 1087, 1087. And in verse number 57... It says, and it came to pass, as they went in, in the way, a certain man said unto the Lord, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You know, I just want to stop for a second and tell you that Satan never tells you the truth. 
He said, oh boy, this is going to be so good. We'll have so much fun. You try this, try this. You're living in bondage right now. I want you to experience freedom. That's a lie right out of the pit of hell. Satan offers nothing good, only bad, but he never tells you the truth. He's an only a liar. It's the only thing he's capable of is lies. And you see it so many times, and I don't want to get sidetracked this morning, but America, you're being lied to on so many fronts. It's so frustrating to watch. And I just want to scream at times. But it's satanic in its origin. Because Satan is a liar. Jesus never has led you astray. He did not promise you a rose garden when you get saved. He didn't say all your problems will be over. And in these, there's three instances of people where they say, Lord, will follow. I'll follow you. I don't follow you. First thing Jesus says, you might be homeless. He said, I don't have a home. You want a, you want a part of that? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying these things will happen, but he makes no guarantees on the comfort in life that you will experience. Number one, he says, there is no comfort. I don't have a place to stay. If you want to follow me, go ahead. But I don't know where we'll be sleeping tonight. Not only that, there was in verses 59 to 60, he said unto another, follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Not only is there not going to be any comfort, there might not be any companionship. You know, it's a, it's a heart-wrenching thing for me to see missionaries go to a foreign country. There was a day and time where when you left for a foreign country, you wouldn't even know if your parents had died until weeks later. You couldn't have come back for a funeral. You wouldn't have known anything. There was no communication. Now we've got social media and things where you can... Uh, our, our, social, our, our, our youth pastor is in South Africa, and he's Skyping or sniping or something with the family. On You can tell I'm right up to speed on all of these things. and They can actually see each other as they're talking, communicating. He's halfway around the world. Things are different now. But Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you can't wait until certain relationships have expired. I've found at times following Christ may cost you even family. You wouldn't think so. It will cost you some of your friends. Jesus didn't say, oh, you'll have more friends. You'll be so popular. No, 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 no. No. If you want to be popular and follow Christ, those two things do not go hand in hand. You're going to have to deny yourself. Number one, he doesn't profit comfort. He doesn't promise companionship. And not only that, in verses 61, another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No, it, I, I've got C's, obviously, comfort, companionship. i got another one. No quitting. No crying. Once you start this process, don't look back. Don't look back. Big problem with the, Egypt, uh, the Jews when they left Egypt. Oh, I miss Egypt. They were crying while they were there. And then they get in the car to leave. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Can we go back? I forgot something. I miss it. I miss it. I miss it. What a bunch of crybabies. You need... Thick skin and a soft heart to follow the Lord, as Chuck Swindoll said. And there's going to be times where you're going to want to quit. Don't even think about it. Just keep moving forward. Don't look back. We need to deny yourself. There, as I've mentioned it before, but at times... It seems like the church thinks it's on a cruise ship rather than a battleship. We're looking for the next good time. And I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise or not, but it's one endless buffet. One endless, if you will, dance party, which I never attended. You don't want to see this old boy dance. It's not a pretty thing, okay? 
It's one endless, one good thing after another to totally just meet all your sensory perceptions. And it's fine. It's wonderful. But you know what? That's not how life is. And when it comes to serving the Lord, you're more on a battleship than on a cruise ship. Nobody wants to man the guns. Nobody wants to put their life on the line. But Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you grab your cross and you deny yourself and let's go. And he was leading by example. Number one, he said to deny himself. Number two, he said to take up your cross. There's a huge difference between following Christ and following the enemy. Satan will lie, cheat, and steal in any way he can to trick you into the pit that he's trying to lead you into. So he can steal and kill and destroy. And we've spent a lot of time recently talking about that. Jesus says right up front, you could be walking to your death. Someone rightfully said, if you do not have anything worth dying for, you don't have anything to live for. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ is worth dying for. He's worth giving your best to. He says to take up your cross is a surrender. Why did he say that? Well, there's three reasons very quickly. Number one, time is short. Jesus said in John 9, 4, must work the works of him that sent me while his day, the night cometh when no man can work. You, listen to me, you don't have as much time as you think you do. You do not. Every week we get news of someone that it looks like they're coming to the end for whatever reason. Found out this week that a friend of mine was killed in a skiing accident. Didn't know it until it was too late. He and I, our birthdays were almost identical, less than a month apart. He had everything. I'm not positive he had Christ. We've talked about it many times. Not positive. I'm sure he thought he had another 25 or 30 years to go. Perfect health. He's gone. Those stories happen every day. You do not have as much time as you think you do. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Number one, time is short. Number two, life is short. I love that saying, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. A man is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. Did you get that? You don't have a thing right now that you can keep. Nothing. You came into this world naked, and you're leaving naked, and I don't care how far you fight. And I've seen families split up trying to hang on to assets. Forget it. You're taking none of that with you. What's the deal? Let it go. A man is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. You and I, in Jesus Christ, are sending rewards ahead. We're shipping things ahead. We have speakers come at times when they want to sell their books. And they ship their books ahead. We get this big bunch of books and we put them out on a table because they know they're coming and they're sending their stuff ahead. You and I, Christian, hopefully, if you're serving the Lord, we're sending our stuff ahead. You don't have anything here that you're going to get to keep. Very quickly, there's an old joke that goes, supposedly this guy had a it was worth a lot of money, had a lot of gold. He had cut a deal with God that he could take his gold with him. <laughs> and so he gets to heaven. He's at the pearly gates, and the angels are checking him in. He says, I have this deal. I can bring my own gold. And here it is. I brought it with me. And <clears throat> the angel looked at that hot top. What do you want a hot top in heaven for? That's all it is. They just use it to pave the roads in heaven. Doesn't mean a thing. So here we are, time is short, life is short, and you have this shot. Years ago, there was a severe snowstorm here, and Dad has a house next door that Phil lives in now. Phil bought it from Dad, and uh, we just got, as we'd say in Maine, we got hammered. There was just a lot of snow, and and when you have a big, heavy, big accumulation of snow, and it was light, and, and 
and if you if you've plowed snow at all you know that you need to what we say you need to keep your feet clean underneath you you can't get let a pile of snow come over the front blade and then get it in under your feet you're stuck and you're shoveling so to do it properly you keep all the snow ahead of you and you keep pushing it to the side and this way and that way and you keep backing up so the area your truck is actually setting in is clear with no snow and it takes time when there's a lot of snow and you can have banks that are too big and so you're just trying to keep it moved around and keep going and so the deal was with this individual that lived there he was a trust fund kid he had no job nothing to do tons of money he lived on family money he lived in the house and dad would say you're gonna plow your own yard I'll supply the truck so this huge storm he didn't know how to move that kind of snow so I got in the truck he's in the passenger side I get in there and I said you got to do this you got to do this you got to move the snow like this and, and I said do not let a pile of snow come over the blade you're gonna be stuck and you're gonna be shoveling and he said this could take all day <laughs> and I looked at him I said you had other plans there was something else you're gonna do and you know it occurred to me as I was thinking of that situation that honestly you and I are trust fund kids we live on our Heavenly Father's money everything we have belongs to him he lets us have it and I'm telling you what I'll raise my hand and swear on my I live a quality life God has taken very good care of me but there are times where we think this could take so much time I don't have time for this do you have something more important than serving God Almighty? Is there something so busy in your life that you can say, Lord, I just can't do that today. This is more, what you're saying is, this is more important than you are. And I found something. I've known three or four trust fund people in my life. They are miserable. They don't know what it's like to work. They don't know what it's like to apply themselves. They don't know what it's like to have a job that they have to get out of bed for and go do something. The check comes every month in the mail. They have all the toys, all the stuff. Snowmobiles, four-wheelers, guns. He had it all. He was miserable. And Christian, you and I have eternal life. Our sin's forgiven. We have a home in heaven. And we sit back at times just sucking up the resources of God's family. And I, you know something? You are miserable in Christ. Because you are not investing yourself in the job that God has called you to do. And I want you to know something. The best way to sleep at night is to work hard during the day. Accomplish something. God made us that way. And we have our churches right full of trust fund Christians that are enjoying the blessings of our Heavenly Father and doing nothing in the process and we wonder why we're not happy. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Lastly, follow me. He says, follow me and I will make you fishes of men. Follow me and let the dead marry the, bury the dead. In Matthew Follow, he said to Matthew, follow me, and he rose and followed him. How does that work? Christian, how does a person follow Jesus Christ? Well, number one, you need to work. We've already touched on that. What is the job that you do every week for Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about your paycheck. I'm not talking about what you do for Viking lumber or, or whatever it is. What is the job that you say, Lord, this is what I do for you? And if you can't instantly answer that, you're an unemployed Christian. You need to get a job. To follow Jesus Christ, you need to be working for him. If you can't think of a job and you're looking for a job, come see us. Mark will give you one. I can give you one. Plenty of them. Plenty of opportunity to serve the Lord. So number one, you need to work. Number two, you need to pray. How's your prayer life? You talk to the Lord lately? You know, if you and I, if I talk to my wife as often as I talk to the Lord at times, we would be estranged. Isn't that awful? He wants to hear from you. Why? Because he likes you. 
I, every now and then, if I see someone that I haven't seen for a long time or something, I look at them and say, you don't write, you don't call. You know, and I'm, obviously I'm just joking with them. But the Lord wants to hear from you. He likes you. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. You're, you're everything to him. He wants to hear from you. To follow the Lord, you need to work for him. You need to pray and talk to him. You need to be reading your Bible, God's love letter to you. Get into it. Read it. Start in Genesis. Go to Revelation. Try to do that on a regular basis. If you say, well, I don't get the Old Testament, then get in Matthew. How about the book of John? Those, the book of John will change your life. Get in that. If you didn't get it the first time, read it through again. Read it through again. You know, there's 31 Proverbs in the Bible, one for every day of the month. Just get in Proverbs every morning. Read that. Be in God's Word. Say that with me. Be in God's Word. Change your life. You won't grow in Christ if you're not in God's Word. You won't. I'm, I, just fact. I'm not trying to be critical. You won't. Work, pray, read God's Word. And something else that occurred to me recently, and, and I hope this makes sense, is that work, pray, and encourage. Encourage people. D.L. Moody tells the story of a, a big fire in New York City. And they thought they had evacuated the building and everybody was out and they realized there was a young person on the fifth story of one of the larger buildings in New York at the time. Of course, Moody was, was preaching in, in a, the time of the Civil War. So there wasn't the skyscrapers, but there was, you know, a five-story building was a good-sized building in those days. And so there was a big fire there, and they thought they had everybody out, and, they, and there was someone screaming on the fifth floor and needed to be rescued. So they put a ladder up there. Back then, those were old wooden ladders. It wasn't anything that was fireproof, but they stood the ladder up there, and a firefighter started going up that ladder. And he got about the second floor, and a big explosion came out that second floor window and about blew him off the ladder, and he almost gave up. And someone on the ground said, Give him a cheer! And they started cheering. Remember the old days when you say, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. I did that a few years ago, and my wife thought I had turned into a geek. I mean, that was the ner <laughs> nerdiest thing she'd ever seen. Well, when we were young, hip, hip, hooray was the big thing. And so they're down on the ground, and they're cheering, and they're cheering. And that old firefighter, he starts going up that ladder. And he grabbed that kid and brought him down all on a cheer, all on encouragement. I'm not going to ask for hands this morning, but... Ever get discouraged following Christ? Feel like you're alone? You know, some of the best things we can do for your Sunday school teacher, maybe your mom and dad's trying to teach you the word, maybe your pastor. Now, listen, don't you encourage me today. Don't do it. I won't believe you. But every now and then, you know, a note in the mail or a slap on the back or an encouragement to someone that has made a difference in your life or someone you see struggling and you think, boy, they look discouraged today. Go along and, and give them a slap on the back and say, you know what? You are making a difference. Let me tell you something, Christian. You are making a difference. Whether you realize it or not, you know what this world would be like without Christians? Who? Oh. There'll come a time where that will be found out after the rapture. And the Bible clearly tells us it will be a time like the world has never seen before. We are salt and light. They may not like us, but we got them surrounded. We make their life better whether they believe it or not. People need to be encouraged. If you want to follow me, Jesus said, I'm headed for Jerusalem. You think, oh, hey, I haven't been to Jerusalem. I'll go. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you don't realize it. This isn't a trip to Disney World. This is a trip that could cost you your life. But it is the greatest decision you could possibly make. I, I hope you make up your mind this morning. I'm going to Jerusalem with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.